Mara Thomas, Editor-in-Chief of UrbanHealthToday.com, part of the DocWire family of medical news sites. And I want to thank you for tuning in to Urban Health Weekly. Our goal each week is to keep you informed of the latest in health and medical news right from today's headlines. It's time to empower yourself with open conversations about your medical care with news that matters to you. So are you ready? Let's get started. And we were talking about a 19th century practice to help with long COVID. In 2012, doctoral student Hosanna Cranky was looking for topics for her dissertation on British literature. A recovering cancer patient, she was struck by the recurring theme of sickness and recuperation in 19th century models. Although Cranky had recently finished immunotherapy treatment, she still felt like a patient. Everyone around her behaved like it was all over and she couldn't express why she didn't feel the same. Why was it, Cranky wondered, that characters in famous Victorian novels from Charles Dickens' Bleak House to Frances Burnett's The Secret Garden felt free to spend so much time getting better? And why is it that nowadays people are expected to recuperate quickly after serious illness or injury? The answer lay in changing attitudes to recovery, she found. Before the advent of modern medical care in the 20th century, people were vulnerable to a raft of infectious diseases from typhoid to tuberculosis. Those who were fortunate enough to survive infection were expected to take a long time to recover fully, Cranky found. This process of restoration, a stage between acute illness and full health, was a major focus of physicians and families. For centuries, the care of convalescents came with its own set of theories and rules intended to prevent relapse and integrate patients back into normal life. With medical advancements, however, tolerance for long recovery waned. Modern medicine is uncomfortable dealing with things where we don't have a quick fix, says Lancelot Pinto, a consultant pulmonologist at the PD Hindu Hospital and Medical Research Center in Mumbai. When there were no cures, patients were allowed to live out the natural history of the disease. For diseases that have a cure now, there is no leeway. It's presumed that if you are cured microbiologically, if the tests come back normal, you don't deserve any more rest and that maybe the symptoms are imagined or psychological in some way. Now, those older ideas about recovery could provide some important perspective for the pandemic, says researchers like Cranky, who studies literature and medical history, as millions of patients who've had COVID-19 find themselves frustrated with the persistence of symptoms for weeks or months beyond their infection. All kinds of illness have lingering effects. But culturally, we don't have a way to talk about it, says Cranky, now an assistant lecturer at the University of Wyoming. I think convalescence is a helpful paradigm for the present moment. You know, that's a very good point. I didn't even realize that we don't do this anymore. Did you realize that? Well, I have a friend who is, uh, she just got diagnosed with uh, long COVID. Mm -hmm. And it's really only been like nine weeks since okay. she had, um, I guess, since she tested uh, um, negative. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. negative. Okay. Uh, yeah. So by now it's like nine weeks and she feels like she's not getting support from everybody around her. Like they're like, well, cause she's still feeling symptoms now and then, and right. not like in a regular way. Like it's almost like a cycle, you know, where she's feeling pretty good one day, but she's still not a hundred percent. And she feels like everybody's like, well, you just have to, you know, like she's feeling yeah, like people are thinking she's lazy. Yeah. That she needs to suck it up. And, um, and yeah, I feel like this is really, um, this is really an important thing. The fact is we don't know how people heal and, and convalescing, um, it has a purpose. I don't think the body springs back. It's not one and done. Yes, you have to give the body a chance to do its work. I certainly did my best to convalesce in 2020 when I had COVID. I rested as much as I could. I steamed myself almost nightly, slept when I felt like it. And it took me about three or four months to feel better three or four months, but then yeah. that was during when everything was closed and it was a little easier to do, but right. still, you know, I did it and that helped. I can't imagine having COVID, having those intense symptoms now. In remember they used to have sanatoriums, remember for people with like tuberculosis? Yes, yes, exactly. And just lay in bed and let the body do what it does. You know, we'll try to give you whatever therapeutics you can, but you've got to rest, rest, it's, rest, it's, rest. This is an insurance thing. Do you think because if you don't have like a cutoff, like in people like sort of convalescing, then they're like That's a good point. There is no room for convalescence in because I remember when my mom had my sister 
It yes. used to be when you had a cesarean section, you stayed in the hospital. I think it was like a week or something yes, like that. Wow. And then she was out in three days with yeah, a baby. Think, yeah. And yeah, with three days with a baby. Yes, and a yes. Fresh wound. And I was yeah. shocked. I was like, what? How are you out so soon? Mm-hmm. But that's 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 what it is now. It's like that's an excellent point. The insurance just it's like, well, if the insurance is not going to pay, then we've got to kick you to the curb. But then also it's this whole idea that your medicine lasts seven days or your medicine lasts two weeks or whatever, and then that's it. Then you should be fine now. Like your symptoms are gone. Um, the medicine has worked and it's a miracle, and now you get back to life. It's this whole, you know instant gratification you know there used to be also this thing you know with the childhood diseases that people used to get that you would see in the 19th century um there was also something to the fact that while you were convalescing as a kid that that had like character building component too that that was part of like forcing a young kid to look inwards like it was part of the mental health and mental growth yes it's wellness yeah it was all part of the whole but it was all part of like you developing as a human being too and a lot of like and having respect for your body having respect for the the awesome power of the human body that's right looking inward but besides your body yeah. also your mind developing things outside of your body in your in your mind and developing your attention span and all these you know enduring boredom and convalescing is not exciting so that was part of character building too you know and oh, and it's okay. just a different you mean like being able to sit still or lay still for a yes, of time? And not be okay. entertained to be like, that was all part of the growing up process. Almost everybody got ill at some point growing up mm-hmm. and convalesced at some right. point. Right. And so that's sort of out of the mix. And now we're not allowed to convalesce, even though you need it. Right. Right. No. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's a, an excellent point. Mm. Lou? Yeah. Well, you know, all I remember is when I got, you know, some of these back in the 19th century. <laughs> you know, when I got some of these childhood diseases, yeah, you know, the convalescing was cool, but, you know, my, my family would give me a bunch of books and schoolwork and make me do Right, stuff. you would read. Yeah, yes. I, I would be forced to read and, and all yes. I wanted to do is get well and get back to my life already, you know. It would, it would, actually, it would actually show me how much I would rather be living and out there than just sitting around and doing nothing. And uh, But you're not doing nothing, but I know what you mean. It feels like you're doing nothing. Yeah, so the but whole your con- body's doing a lot. Yeah, the whole convalescing thing, you know, for me psychologically was never any good, but you know, when you- Ah, sick, but it made it, you know what you didn't like. <laughs> yeah, but when you're, when you're really sick physically, you know, you just want to just lay there and not get up. And then, and then at some point, you know, when you when you want to get this. So the, the human body, I think, has a clock for that. And I think it's important to respect the human body. Yeah, that's and, a good point. And again, and again, not make convalescent a function of a work schedule or my weekend is over, I got to get back to work, even though I still feel like crap, et cetera, et cetera. That's the other thing, too, with the amount of sick days people have and stuff like that. Yeah, they don't have available vacation and sick days and, right. and things like that. They have them, but people people use them for, uh, you know. People, for, well, some people do mis- misuse them, but I, I'm just saying, in a perfect world where you have a job and you have sick days, let's say you have, I don't know, what does the average worker get for sick days? Not executive, but like two, a two sick two days, week, a week, ten days, ten, really, ten days, ten days a year or something like that, right? Yeah, All right, but you don't get you don't get vacation though. You don't get like well, so like sometimes you, you end up vacation. having. All right, let's take something like maternity. Now, right. you and I both know that it takes more than just three months to recuperate from having a baby. And your right. baby is really so young that and first, baby is that so first, needy. Yeah. That first three months, you know, technically they're still kind of like should be in the womb size, but because of the way humans are built, they come out earlier, right? Right. So at least that's what the science says. Um, and so this baby really essentially needs you. And then you have to go back to work and you have to put your baby who needs you in someone else's care, and right. you're still not fully recovered. You know, they say six right. months, 
or something like that for your uterus to shrink back down. But that's just your uterus shrinking back down. Six months out, my labs were still all over the place. Yeah. The little one. Because all the hormones were still running through me. Yeah, I, my I, labs I, were all over too. Yes. Yeah. You know, you you don't fully recover. Like, th- I don't know who, who came up with this idea that three months is enough. Well, it was, what, it, what it did, you know, when I, when I was... Uh, what, efficiency you know, experts? That's you know, what I think, a bean mm-hmm. counter. Yeah. Yeah, when, a male I, be- yeah. bean counter who will never have a baby. <laughs> when when I was in charge of a large flock of people, um, what it did is it and it worried me as a boss because time and time again, women would opt to work until the baby was out there just so that they could get their full every second. Oh, so literally work up until the point when they were in labor. So the water was, breaks. It yeah. Freak me <laughs> out. And I would start, you know, maybe you can work. And back then working from home wasn't that, you know, that, that wasn't easy. a big thing. Right. And there wasn't really all the technologies from it, but I, I would always find like some excuse to send them home. And, um, and, uh, you know, not start the time until the baby came out. But it's difficult. It's a difficult, um, it's a difficult choice to make. It really is. Because that last month, it's like all you want to do is sit down and be off your feet and just everything is so heavy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's like, then you have to work. Now, just imagine you're working in like a factory or something like that. And you're doing that because mm-hmm. you have to make that difficult choice. You know, some countries give you um, six months and some of these Scandinavian countries, they give you an entire year. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. And you get like, um, you get somebody comes to check on you at your house. There's that too. You get a oh. certain amount of like home health aid coming to check oh, on you. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. That's very nice. That's part, that's paid for by the state. Like Belgium has that too. I'm just convinced that, you know, this country doesn't care about women. I'm yeah, doing- I am too. <laughs> I mean, it's just it's just baked into everything. It's everything is just right. so patriarchal. So you know this this idea of convalescing. You know, we should really kind of get back to that. I don't know if we ever can, but with the great res- resignation, now I think people have time to <laughs> convalesce if they need to. Although we've got all these therapeutics and vaccinations, so I don't see why people should still. But hey, you know, if your immune system is not great. That it doesn't mean that you're 100% immune to, to getting some variant of COVID. But I like this idea of convalescence. I, I do believe, too. I can't believe medicine has just changed so much that uh, we've just moved away from the, the body and the mind. FDA approves weekly patch to treat Alzheimer's related dementia. Hmm. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration, FDA, has approved a weekly skin patch used to treat symptoms of Alzheimer's-related dementia. The treatment is a patch formulation of the oral drug Dinepazil, or Aricept is the drug name, which has been available for many years and is one of the most commonly prescribed drugs for patients with Alzheimer's disease. The new medication, which will be sold under the brand name Adlarity, is not the first skin... Why are they changing the name? Why can't it just be the Aricept patch? Anyway, Adlarity is not the first skin patch approved for Alzheimer's disease, but it is the first to be administered once weekly. This regimen is expected to benefit certain patients. It would be better for forgetful patients who have to remember taking their medications or patients who have paranoia and refuse to take medications, for example. Ah. Neurologist Reedy Patiri, MD, who's an assistant professor and investigator at the University of Pittsburgh Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Mm -hmm. Another advantage of the patch is the potential for fewer side effects. According to Dr. Patera, the most common adverse reactions to the oral denepazil are gastrointestinal problems such as nausea and diarrhea. Those should not be completely eliminated as they are directly caused by the drug's mechanism of action but they will likely be less severe with the skin patch compared to the oral formulation. Adlarity can be placed directly on a patient's back, thigh, or buttocks, according to press release from Corium Inc., the drug's maker. The once weekly patch delivers a continuous and consistent dose of denepazil through the skin. That's certainly a good idea to have. Uh, That is a good idea. Uh, That's the caregiver, I would think, right? 
it helps with caregivers, that's for sure. Because, yeah. and it, it, there really is something to that. Sometimes you get a patient that's really like a little bit paranoid that that does mm -hmm. happen or is like averse to taking pills. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I don't need it. Well, I don't need it. Why am I taking it? To trust an Alzheimer patient to take their pill on time is. Right. Yes. Know, that's not going to happen. So. Right. It's practical. This sounds very practical. I wonder if you can. Um, if, if you can, can you leave it on for showers and baths and stuff like that? I wonder, will that loosen it? Or I wonder, they didn't really talk about that in the article. You know, it sounds like a set it and forget it. Like how do the, uh, how do the other patches, you know, like estrogen patch and all that? I don't patches. know. I know that I've, I've taken, I've used patches for um, the B, the B vitamin, you know, to keep mosquitoes away. I've used those patches and that patch you um, can't shower with, or you can? You can shower with that patch. Oh. Yes. I mean, it leaves a weird mark on your skin afterward, but you can shower with it, and I think it lasts a few days or something like that. All but right. Shower with it. But I don't know. It's, it, you know, that's a vitamin patch versus, um, you know, some drug formulation. So I don't know. But that would be a good question to answer. Anyway, they get deeper into the pathways for how this works, but you can read all about it on urbanhealthweekly.com. Well, 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 well. Study finds lumpectomy may be as effective as mastectomy for patients with non-metastatic breast cancer younger than 40. Young women with non-metastatic breast cancer have similar survival rates whether they are treated with mastectomy or lumpectomy, lumpectomy, sorry, despite tumors that are typically more aggressive and discovered at a later stage compared to their older counterparts. These findings were from a recent study examining women with non-metastatic breast cancer younger than age 40 presented by Pastana et al. at the American Society of Breast Surgeons 23rd Annual Meeting. The study is among the largest on the impact of surgical approach on survival outcomes in a young patient population. The results are particularly significant because younger women are increasingly being diagnosed with breast cancer despite low rates overall and a growing number are undergoing mastectomy and even prophylactic bilateral mastectomy rather than breast conserving surgery, said lead study author Christine Pestana, a breast surgical oncology fellow at Atrium Health, Levine Cancer Institute. Studies like this show that lumpectomy, a far less aggressive approach with fewer potential complications and morbidity, is equally as effective as removing an entire breast. Dr. Pistana believes that many young women may be influenced by their age and equate an aggressive approach with better long-term survival. However, with mastectomy comes greater risk of problems such as infection, wound issues, chronic pain, and subsequent multiple reconstructive procedures. A decision on breast cancer surgical treatment has many implications, and these women will live with them the rest of their lives, she said noting that younger women with breast cancer may constitute a unique and underrepresented population. Studies specifically focusing on these patients would likely yield important information that may help physicians better understand, counsel, and treat these patients and help women in their decision-making. One thing the study didn't discuss is whether any of these women had any um, genetic mutations to predispose them to cancer. Oh yeah, because that would, wouldn't that change your decision-making process? Well, maybe. Um, what I didn't like about this um, article, to me, it felt a little offensive because I didn't like the subtle implication that women over 40 are somehow immune to these same complications and considerations. Like, are you trying to tell me that- Or maybe they just feel like, oh, it's tolerable. They'll have to handle it. They're well, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's almost like once they figure you're, you're past your, your childbearing years that right. you just throw your parts away. So you, are you trying to tell me then that lumpectomy for me won't be beneficial if I develop non-metastatic breast cancer? So I started doing some digging and I found a much larger retrospective study Ooh. of stage one and two breast cancer patients from China. And they concluded that BRCA uh, one or two variant carriers treated with breast cancer conserving therapy, AKA lumpectomy, have a survival comparable to those treated with mastectomy. Ah. So I was wondering like, well, is this, is this different somehow because I have BRAC2? No, not really. So in general, lumpectomy has, gives you the same results 
as mastectomy. So you don't need to go the radical mastectomy point. Now, there's also the issue of contralateral breast cancer, which is cancer occurring in the other breast sometime after the first breast is diagnosed. That usually happens like about six months or more later. And that's something that BRCA carriers have to think about. Uh, but, so they may end up with double lumpectomies. Right. But I want to point out that the odds of getting a repeat cancer are higher in general for women who have had a first cancer, period. Okay. You know what I'm saying? So if yes. you've never had a cancer, your chances of getting another cancer are higher in general. And this, the larger- that's specifically uh, another breast cancer? Yeah. And that's regardless of whether you carry a gene mutation or not. Okay. So, I mean, it probably means nothing, but it was just worth putting out there. And the, so the study, the first study of the young women was about 600 patients and none of them, you know, to my knowledge were ID'd as having or being tested for a gene mutation. So there are some flaws in that study, but I just didn't like the, the I didn't like the, the tone, that. like suddenly you're put out to pasture when you're a certain age. Yeah, you know, it's like, well, we don't life, life. sports anymore. Right. So we may as well just take them. Right. So, you know, it's a conversation to have with your doctor, but it should be an informed conversation that you have with your doctor. Thanks for listening to Urban Health Weekly today. I hope you'll join me and my friends next week so you can stay informed and inspired to take control of your health. See you next time.